morning, everybody. Uh, didn't expect to be back so soon, but uh, before I talk about COVID a little bit, I uh, just wanted to remind everybody it is election day, so get those ballots in. Uh, even though we've still got a pandemic going, it's really important to vote in your local elections. So uh, we know that elections really matter, so please vote. So uh, here we are again. Uh, the virus clearly is adapting and changing and uh, really remains a major threat. Uh, we're in our fifth wave in Snohomish County of the COVID virus. And so um, I'd hope by this time we'd be seeing declines and be full recovery. Clearly that's not the case. So as Dr. Spitters will be talking about a little bit, I'm sure uh, our hospitals are filling up close to capacity and we're really seeing the negative effects of people refusing to help themselves. And that's hard words, but uh, we know that everybody's had access, everybody 12 and older has had access to a very effective and safe vaccine. And it's extremely frustrating to me that so many are refusing to be vaccinated. In my previous career as a fish biologist, uh, you know, I was used to studying how fish were impacted by things, disease, physical, chemical, biological changes, and you really look for the, the cause and work to uh, use that information to remove or prevent that cause. And with COVID, it's quite clear we know the course or the source of the harm. It's a virus. Um, we have an amazing set of vaccines that have been developed in almost record time, but with a lot of science behind them. Many, many years of science went into the ability to create these vaccines. So we know uh, we have a way to prevent serious death and disease. Uh, we had hoped that, um, frankly, oh, we had hoped, frankly, that uh, the uh, vaccines would also prevent be getting contagious or uh, carrying the disease. That's clearly now not the case that you can be vaccinated, and still carry it, but your risk of death or uh, serious uh, um, sickness is really greatly reduced. So at this point, uh, the fear of the vaccine over the virus is really a sickness that's as harmful as COVID-19. Uh, the health professionals and politicians and all this can repeat ourselves endlessly, but some still believe they're being lied to or there's some great conspiracy. That's not the case. We are here to give you the absolute best information we can. And please um, look at the data, look at the people in our community that have uh, passed away and look at our hospital rates and uh, compare that to the many millions who have been vaccinated. The vaccines clearly work. They're clearly safe. There is no comparison between the risk of getting vaccinated and the risk of the disease. So I think I want this pandemic to be over. We all do. Uh, it's uh, wearing on our families and our lives and our businesses. Uh, we just want to be done with this. Uh, this last 18 months have been very difficult for us and for the nation and for the world, frankly. But there's only one rational way out, and that's to get vaccinated and use common sense. So we've really understood viruses for a long time. Uh, we do keep getting surprised by COVID-19 and how it's mutated and how uh, contagious it is. But we know that two shots in the arm, and you can almost be certain that you won't get seriously ill or die. So please do this for yourselves, do this for your families, do this for your communities and, and country. Uh, it's, it's the right thing to do on so many levels. It's a safe thing and it's the effective thing. So please get vaccinated. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Snohomish Health District uh, Officer, Dr. Chris Spitters. Thank you, Executive Summers, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to just show you some uh, figures to uh, uh, really garnish the uh, direct and uh, uh, clear comments that Executive Summers put forth here. Uh, uh, hopefully now you're seeing our weekly case count, and uh, you're familiar with this. These are the number of cases reported uh, by week. So each bar is a week, and here we are 
uh, we reached the bottom there a little over a month ago. And, and like uh, the time between all the previous waves, we just haven't been able to make that last. And uh, cases have been going up uh, about 30% per week. This tentative figure here of 680 is a provisional figure through Saturday. We, uh, the, the state health department has two days worth of data that hasn't come through out of the past week. So we, we um, you know, uh, projected based on the five days of data we had, but we, as I walked in the door today, I just learned that we had uh, about 600 cases drop into our system. Um, I'm guessing that at least half of those came from last week. So these numbers, when they're final, will be revised upwards. We'll probably be closer to 900 cases for last week. And uh, the corresponding case rate is uh, now up to 193 based on those numbers I just showed you. But again, once we finalize uh, that based on the new the, you know, the cleaning up uh, the leftover unreported cases from last week, it looks like we're going to be far north of 200, which is CDC's high transmission category. Um, so this, uh, you know, uh, cases are now two and a half times what they were a month ago. Uh, this is not sustainable. As you can see, we've, you know, we, we, we're, I'll show you in a minute, we've got hospitalization problems and got to remember, we've got almost 45,000 cases to date over 2000 hospitalizations and over 600 deaths. Uh, and we just, we have the means uh, to prevent that. And uh, so we need to, we need to get back in the, in the right direction here. Ne I'm gonna go to the next slide here and just show you our hospital uh, situation. These are the last several weeks with the red arrow, uh, just indicating that, you know, things go up and down based on, there's kind of a weekly cycle to hospitalizations in general, but uh, general, definitely the trend is up. And uh, hospital, uh, you know, you, uh, the hospitalization rate, the, the number of new people going into the hospital with COVID is uh, about four times what it was over a month ago. More concerning in the short term is that, uh, you know, two weeks ago, we had 22 people in the hospital countywide with COVID. Then last week when, when we spoke, we had 36, and now we've got 61. Uh, so that's clearly up, up, up. Uh, we're seeing, you know, basically the same age groups, a little bit younger, maybe, uh, you know, the average age is in the 50s instead of in the 60s, but hospitalizations are occurring right down into the 20s, uh, but the, the majority are in the 40, 50, 60 year age groups. Um, and what, so why is this happening? You know, uh, well, uh, there's several factors, excuse me, uh, there we go. Uh, several factors that I'm just going to briefly review with you here. Number one is the, the Delta strain of the virus that is now responsible for the overwhelming majority of infections in Snohomish County and throughout the state. And, um, you know, it's, it's predicted that this, this data actually runs through July 10, that last bar on the right showing 76% of, of, of typed cases. Uh, were, were Delta. That's probably up to 90% now. So uh, this, this strain is at least twice as contagious, meaning given a, the same amount of exposure, uh, somebody with Delta will infect twice as many contacts as uh, someone who had a previous strain. Um, so uh, as a result of that, and this is going to uh, affect some of our, our prevention measures, uh, we are seeing increased numbers of breakthrough cases, meaning uh, confirmed COVID cases and people who are fully vaccinated. Uh, but the vaccine overall is still very effective. The rate of infection, the rate of hospitalization, and the rate of death uh, due to COVID in vaccinated people is, is roughly 90% lower uh, th than it is in, in unvaccinated people. So that's something we, we really all need to keep in mind. Even as the, the large proportion of the community gets vaccinated, we'll see more breakthrough cases. And then this Delta strain, uh, although we can uh, still count on the vaccine to help us greatly, it's slightly less effective against, uh, uh, against the Delta, but still uh, it's in all in our best interest, you know, uh, to, to 
get that because it's going to reduce your risk if you're currently unvaccinated by about 90 percent. Okay, next slide. And that does take us to vaccination. Uh, the highlighted sections, I just want to emphasize that half of the population uh, is currently fully uh, immunized, but that's clearly not enough coverage uh, given the level of freedoms that we're enjoying or exercising because uh, in the last month, uh, since we kind of opened things up, cases have gone up, 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 and now the hospitals are filling up and we, we just need a much higher coverage to permit safe and sustainable public life at the reduced level of protections being required. And frankly, we're, we also need to start layering back in those protections uh, in order to keep our world running, commerce, recreation, worship, education, you name it. And so uh, we, we've got one third of the eligible population, 27% of the entire county, hasn't even started with a first dose yet, uh, although vaccines have been widely available for several months. And uh, I cannot improve on the comments that Executive Summers made. It's just something that we have to do as a community, a county, a state, and a nation, and a, and a world to, to get through to the other end of this. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that there's 125,000 children who are not eligible for vaccination. And while they have a milder disease and probably don't spread it as much as, as older kids and adults, uh, children still do suffer. They can transmit to others in their household and beyond. And it's really unknown what the long-term uh, consequences are like long COVID in kids. Uh, and so there's a lot of reason to try to protect them as well as the immunosuppressed, immunosuppressed, oh, I think I'm frozen. You're okay. Oh, I'm okay, all right. Uh, immunosuppressed individuals um, in the community who have been vaccinated, but are not as well protected by the vaccine. So next slide. Uh, this is a sign you're seeing at the front of many um, uh, enterprises. Um, this is actually from the state and the health district is if you're not fully vaccinated, please continue to wear your mask. And, uh, you know, the I think the problem we're seeing is that that's kind of getting translated in a license to uh, not wear a mask in many settings because we just We've gone from everyone wearing a mask to virtually no one wearing a mask, and yet there's a third of us who are not vaccinated. Um, and furthermore, uh, we need to keep in mind that there are settings where masks are required for all, regardless of vaccination status. They're listed there, but healthcare, schools, childcare, public transportation, jails and correction, congregate living settings like shelters and other places like that. Uh, but furthermore, given the presence of the Delta virus and the risk of breakthrough infections, which are much, much lower than the risk of getting infected if you're unvaccinated, nevertheless, uh, one, we, we just want to see everyone masking up in, in public indoor places. Uh, not only does it prevent people with COVID from spreading it to others, uh, especially if they're asymptomatic and don't know it, that, that mask catches those droplets that others would otherwise breathe in. Uh, but when we wear a mask, we are protected from others. It's not perfect. It's not like the high-grade medical masks that we wear in isolation rooms and hospitals, but a good double-layer, well-fitting cotton mask can filter out about 50% of the particles that we would otherwise bring in. And given that part of the way we think Delta is transmitting more to others is the larger number of viral particles that are being sent out into the uh, environment, uh, that's a good way to protect yourself. And, and even if you're vaccinated, we're recommending wear your mask. So in the end, uh, please, everybody put a mask on on public settings, get vaccinated. If you're not vaccinated yet, make sure to get both doses of the mRNA vaccine. If that's the one you get, that second dose has been shown to be very important for completing the uh, immune response that would be effective against Delta. And then remember all the other layers of protection, like keeping your distance, minimizing gatherings with folks that you don't know or whose vaccination status is unknown, 
hand hygiene, all that. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Executive Summers. Thank you, Doctor. Um, so the first question is about masks and it's uh, to both of us. Do you continue to wear a mask in indoor public settings such as grocery store? If so, why or why not? Well, I'll admit I stopped wearing a mask uh, indoors when we, the science started going up saying if you were fully vaccinated, um, you didn't need to. I have now started again wearing both a mask and a pin that says I'm fully vaccinated, uh, trying to send a message that even though uh, we're vaccinated, it's now the recommendation to wear masks indoors. So um, I got to admit, don't like it, uh, but uh, get along fine with the mask and it's just getting used to it again. And that's going to be my uh, a standard from here on out until we hear otherwise. Doctor, do you want to comment on that? Uh, yes, by all means, I uh, do continue to wear a mask in all public indoor settings, especially uh, places where uh, it's not clear who's vaccinated, who's not, who's wearing a mask uh, and isn't, and whether they're vaccinated. So the grocery, the pharmacy, the hardware store, clothes shopping, you name it, uh, I try to keep a mask on at all times when I'm uh, indoors and outside the home, or if I'm outdoors and things are crowded. Uh, but again, going back to former times, if I'm, whether it's indoors or outdoors, if I end up somewhere that looks too crowded to space out, I, I try to leave. Um, so there you have it. Okay, next question is, New York City announced today that they will require vaccinations for customers and employees in certain indoor settings. Do you support this mandate and could Snohomish County see something like that in the near future? Or to start, Doctor? Sure. Well, I, I, uh, you know, I first would begin by encouraging all of our enterprises and proprietors to, uh, to, to support these indoor masking recommendations. And, uh, you know, I think we'd... I, you know, we, we made this announcement a week ago. We don't have a lot of time when you're looking at the hospitalizations going up. That's a, that's a pretty steep climb and there's not a lot of room above uh, where we're at now. Uh, so we do need people to, to take this, uh, these recommendations. I would kind of upgrade it from a recommendation to a request at this point to, to mask up indoors and to have our proprietors uh, support that uh, in their, in their settings. Um, if we're unable to achieve it uh, voluntarily, then, then you know, to protect hospital capacity and our ability to take care of COVID and all the other problems that need to come into hospitals, uh, we might need to take that further step. Um, uh, but, but I'd say, let's, you know, we can do this. Let's just do it uh, without being told, ideally. You know, let me just say that uh, certainly we are talking at uh, the county about our practices, our employees, and the public in our buildings. You know, currently we have a, a policy that if you're a member of the public, you should wear a mask in, indoors. That's because we can't really tell whether people are vaccinated or not. And our employees are allowed to uh, go maskless, but we are talking about changes. Uh, to that policy to require masks at all times. We're in discussions with the state about that. Uh, one of the things we try really hard to do and been mindful of um, with uh, Dr. Spitters and the health district and the county and, and the state is we try to uh, coordinate our discussions and our responses because we think it is important that there's some consistency across jurisdictions. Um, when you start getting different rules in different places, it gets very confusing. And uh, for some people, that's an excuse uh, just to not do anything. So uh, we are definitely talking about um, tightening our restrictions. They're not uh, imminent yet, but uh, discussions are in place. And I certainly do support, and I would personally support uh, uh, private businesses that require uh, either proof of vaccination uh, or mass indoors. I think that's uh, an appropriate proactive step for them to take and I do support that. And I'm sorry, we had two questions kind of on the same thing and I hope we've uh, gotten uh, to both questions on that. And if, if not, we can come back to it. Um, this, for Dr. Spitters, how do current hospitalizations compare to earlier waves, uh, particularly the waves that happened in the winter and spring of 2021? Is the hospitalization increase on par with increases of overall cases?
Doctor, you're on mute. Yeah, there we go. Uh, the 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 trajectory of the in, increase in hospitalizations is very similar to what we saw in that third wave back in November, December, January, and. Uh, you know, I think unmitigated, that's our destination. Right now, we're, as I said, about a little over 60 people in the hospital with COVID countywide. At the peak uh, back in, you know, March, April of 2020, and then again in th this past December, January, I think we peaked right around that same level. So we're, we're halfway up that, that ladder. I just... Uh, I think we have an opportunity to to avoid that because that's really a uh, a big challenge uh, for uh, the hospitals to provide care to everyone that needs it. Even now, even now, it's an issue. Even before this surge, because the hospitals have been facing a, a, a medical surge unrelated to COVID prior to this this fifth wave, and so they're really really stressed and. Um, both at the human uh, human resources level as well as just space equipment, et cetera. So we've really got to try to turn this around. This is kind of a follow-up question, but uh, should hospitals and medical organizations follow the lead of Multicare and Kaiser Permanente and require vaccinations for all employees? Well, I 110% I, I support uh, mandatory vaccination for healthcare providers, absolutely. Let's see. Uh, on social media, I've noticed uh, an increased level of what are clearly conspiracy theories. People angrily demand that we in the media go into hospitals and count the patients with COVID. They seem to be inferring hospitals aren't overwhelmed and COVID is no big deal. I could go on, but I'm sure you agree too. Is there anything that can be done by leaders to more strongly react to disinformation? Uh, well, yeah, uh, we all see it. I uh, see so many things uh, still uh, people denying the virus even exists um, all the way to, uh, you know, that the still saw somebody sticking a magnet to their arm because claiming that there's chips in there. So there's all kinds of crazy uh, theories and information flying around out there. And it's very hard to combat it because it, that information spreads so quickly and so widely uh, on social media. But all I think we can do, or my suggestion is be here, uh, try to get good information out, assure people that the, the information systems um, and the information flow from professionals to professionals is, is a good system. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's solid. Uh, the hospitals are, uh, you know, frankly, they report out to us. It's quite clear that they are extremely concerned. They're struggling uh, in workers, but all, all we can do is try to pump out the right information. Uh, going in is not an option for the media, really, but uh, talking to hospital administrators certainly would be. So I think there's some things we could do to get maybe closer to the source of information that might be helpful. But, Doctor? Uh, yeah, you covered it. I, I agree. First, you know, the hospitals themselves are a good source. They are uh, uh, not part of government and, uh, you know, they, they have uh, no reason to generate a conspiracy about what their COVID census is. Nothing I can think of. They're struggling and th those healthcare workers are struggling and have been so for almost two years now. So, um, that's a it's a it's a problem, and you know we're in this information age where uh, the quality of information that uh, we can access now is much more diverse in 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 uh, than it used to be, and you can find a lot of stuff that's not true or that's frankly intended to steer you the wrong way, and uh, you know part of I think. <laughs> you know, uh, thriving and surviving in the modern world in the information age is uh, uh, selecting your information sources wisely. And uh, so we try to help by doing that and uh, certainly try to point people toward CDC, state health department, uh, reputable uh, academic institutions and other like sources of information, as well as news media and uh, you know, on our social media sites, we try to, you know, address such uh, misinformation or disinformation when it occurs, but it's an ongoing struggle. And I think that's part of the part of the world we live in now. Yeah, I, I've just decided personally um, that when I see misinformation, I try to call it out 
and try to uh, provide good sources of information back. At the end of the day, each individual, you know, has to decide for themselves and uh, just encourage to look into issues and look for good sources of information. I frankly don't know what more to do except um, the, the people that are spreading disinformation, I, I am absolutely certain some of it is very purposeful and designed to confuse and create uh, some chaos. And uh, the only way you can fight back against that is to speak out against it and pro provide good sources of information with backup and, and data. A lot of the information I see is just assertions or assertions that um, something is true and with no backup and usually you can find uh good information to counter that and that's uh, that's all i know to do and, and i'm trying to do that um do you expect any changes uh in the recommendations for in-person schooling versus uh back in class schooling dr spitters well i think our experience in the spring uh, the experience of others around the country and the world suggests that, uh, one, the benefits of school uh, uh, are very high for kids. They've been through a lot, both in terms of uh, delayed education and uh, the mental health and social impacts of being out. Uh, kids can be safely schooled uh, with proper prevention measures in place, even if unvaccinated. Uh, and, you know, masking is going to be a key part of that. Uh, but we, I think I su support uh, the existing guidance, which is that in-person school is the default approach for the fall with all the prevention measures in place. And that, you know, kids should really be the first in and the last out in terms of our public life. Uh, and so um, education really needs to be our priority. Uh, and so I'm sticking with that. So uh, last question this morning, I know you have to leave right at 10, doctor, uh, quickly. Given the increased hospitalization deaths were the reasons why capacity limits were introduced in the past, how likely is it that there will soon be a cap on social gatherings? Should businesses start to prepare for social distancing requirements again? Well, uh, you know, I think it's still a good idea, especially, you know, Delta's around, rates are going up. Uh, I think it's all good for us to keep, try to keep six feet between households in public spaces and mask up indoors. And when we're outdoors, mask up when we can't maintain that kind of distance and just use that common sense. Uh, remember that in a group of 50 people right now in Snohomish County, uh, there would be about an 18% chance that there's a, an infectious case of COVID in that space. So, uh, you know, I think it our common sense uh, should be driving us to just pursue that level of protection and that level of social distancing and limiting gatherings on our own, uh, certainly if we reach a point uh, where hospitalizations are continuing to go up, which I think they will, you know, then the pressure is gonna be more on us to, to uh, impose that again, uh, rather than have it be voluntary. But I strongly recommend and request that people, you know, dial back on the amount of gathering you're doing because uh, we've, got, uh, we've got a big wave coming at us. Yeah, and just uh, to, just a short add. Uh, I think we're headed more towards uh, like businesses requiring proof of immunization, uh, employers requiring that, uh, more requirements of masking indoors. Uh, I th think that's where we're headed more so than uh, the caps on uh, gatherings. I, I think that's a hard uh, thing we need to put back in the model. But uh, clearly, rewarding good behavior and providing disincentives for poor behavior is probably uh, where we're headed, but we'll, we'll see over the coming weeks. Makes sense to me too, Executive Summers. All right, thank you everyone. This is Carrie. I think we got through the questions. Appreciate all of your time and please stay tuned. We will send advisories when we have additional media availabilities in the future. So thank you again, have a great day. Thank you.